good evening. It's, uh, it's a real privilege to be here in Omaha at this uh, forum. I've been an admirer over the years for, uh, for the League and uh, for uh, like-minded uh, folks. Um, I'm going to talk about climate change uh, and uh, the military from a military perspective. But I want to start by saying that you really can't talk about just climate change without putting it in a broader context. So here's my premise. Our energy security, our economic security, and our environmental security are all inextricably linked. And they really form a foundation for our overall national security. If you want to do something significant, in, the, in our economy or in our energy portfolio or dealing with the environment, you have to be very, very careful about opening your aperture and thinking what is going to happen in those other aspects of our national security. So with that in mind, we in the United States Department of Defense, I'll, sp I'll speak mostly about our Department of the Navy, which is two services, Navy and Marine Corps, and what we are doing related to energy security, related to environmental security, how it directly ties to our mission effectiveness, and oh, by the way, the economics of uh, doing that. So in uh, December of 2010, India Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, deployed to Afghanistan, and they deployed in a really, really nasty area uh, called Sangin. And it was tough. The Brits were already there. Casualty rates were high. After India 3-5 had gotten there and had been there for about three weeks, Taliban was everywhere in that part of Afghanistan at that time. Uh, they suffered over 25% casualties, killed or wounded, within about three weeks. As luck would have it, they had been provided with some renewable energy and some energy efficiency technology by the commandant at the time, Jim Conway. And he said, look guys, we think that this can help you in your mission. It's in an austere environment, but you're going to be working at forward operating bases uh, pretty far away from logistics lines. And uh, if, you, if it helps, great. Uh, if, it, uh, if it doesn't, uh, throw it in the darn river. And, and he was serious about that. So they had commercial off-the-shelf solar panels, solar panels like you can find around uh, here in uh, Omaha or in uh, other parts of the country. And they had these flexible solar panels that they could put in their backpack and take out on patrol so that they could use them to recharge rechargeable batteries so they didn't have to be weighed down by uh, all kinds of uh, throwaway batteries. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs at, uh, at one point, uh, Marty Dempsey, said, if you're looking for an Army unit or a Marine Corps unit on patrol in uh, Afghanistan, all you need to do is follow the, the uh, trail of discarded, non-renewable uh, batteries because they've got so much gear that requires power night vision devices, GPS, communications gear, et cetera. It was essential. So the commandant sent them out with these solar panels that they could unfold and recharge their, their batteries and have that, that uh, capability. Of course, being good Marines, what weight they didn't have to uh, use for disposable batteries, they carried more ammo and, uh, and probably more water and, fo and food as well. They also had, uh, for the op forward operating base, LEDs, light-emitting diodes. And back in 2010, that was fairly, uh, fairly new stuff. But the net result was this forward operating base, combination of meeting a good portion of their energy demands with these fixed solar panels and the fact that they could light things at a far uh, lower power consumption with LEDs, really, really helped to take Marines off of fuel convoys. Fuel convoys in Iraq and in Afghanistan 
are one of the deadliest missions because of improvised explosive devices, roadside bombs, or ambushes with rocket propelled grenades. So the idea that you could lessen your dependence on these diesel fuel convoys to keep the diesel generators going was a big deal. It kept Marines taking the fight to the Taliban and not simply defending themselves to try to get that fuel convoy to the forward operating base. I talked with one of them uh, many, uh, many months after they came back, and there was an incident in which the Taliban attacked this forward operating base. After the fight, the Marines prevailed, as you would expect, but after the fight, they noticed that there was shrapnel damage from the fragments from, re, uh, from rocket propelled grenades on some of these uh, solar panels. But the amazing thing was the lights never went out because they degraded in their efficiency, but it still kept powering the base and the needs. And I said, I can't imagine what it would have been like if those rocket propelled grenade fragments had hit a diesel generator set. First of all, the lights would have gone out immediately, and secondly, probably would have had Marines killed or wounded. So I thought back then, <coughs> after 2010, if solar power and renewable energy is good enough for the Marines in a fight in Afghanistan, what the hell is wrong with the rest of the country? Why can't we, why can't we get on with it? The point of the story clearly is that the things we are doing in our Navy and Marine Corps related to energy security are directly related to our mission. Our mission effectiveness, our combat capability, our operational efficiency, that's why we're doing it. Now, we do use terms that get folks' attention like the Great Green Fleet or uh, the Green Hornet uh, flying on biofuel. but. Primarily, it is all about making the mission more effective for our Navy and our Marine Corps. And I'll talk a little bit about that. At the same time, however, we do have this dividend uh, that can be measured in increased environmental security. And that is by making ourselves more effective and efficient with energy and diversifying our supplies of energy from strictly fossil fuel to renewables, we are lowering our greenhouse gas footprint. That is a secondary event, a uh, secondary effect, and we're very, very proud of it, but it's not the primary motivator. But it illustrates the fact that, no kidding, if you look at every aspect of our American, indeed, an international economy and international societies, you can, in fact, find value in renewable energy and you don't have to be a tree hugger. Are there any tree huggers in the room? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a closet tree hugger. Oh, I guess, I guess I'm out of the closet. I, how did that happen? So the point is, it's all about what is the pragmatic solution for making our energy choices? And does it have a positive or negative effect on our environmental security? And clearly what we're doing in terms of diversifying our portfolio, being less carbon intense is really, really good for environmental security. And for economic security, the fact that we have procured over one gigawatt of renewable energy to supply our bases across this country, our, um, our, our Navy and Marine Corps bases, that's a great market signal to the, the folks that are creating jobs, creating new value chains, uh, energy efficiency technology. It's a great economic benefit to the financial community because many of these projects that we have done are third party finance. So folks like uh, Hannon Armstrong, Bostonia, Bank of America, investing in projects, not directly with us, but they know that we are the off taker and they know that they can get a steady rate of return over many, many decades in, in, in most cases, and just really uh, it's good for our economy. So environmental, energy, and, uh, and economic security, all in the name of national security. 
We did a project early on. We established a renewable energy program office. We affectionately refer to it as REPO. And it was established in May of 2014 to really, really accelerate our efforts to get renewable energy across our Navy and Marine Corps shore installations, our bases, if you will. So one of the first big projects out of the chute was a 150 megawatt solar project. It was ultimately named Mesquite 3, about 50 miles to the west of Phoenix. And it was intended to provide clean electrons to our 14 Navy and Marine Corps bases in California. So I was down there in October. We threw the switch, and we've got that happening. And oh, by the way, it's going to happen for 25 years. It's going to meet over one-third of our total electrical demand in those 14 bases in California. It contributes to the state's uh, renewable portfolio standard. And oh, by the way, it's cheaper than brown power. So I mean, it really <laughs> illustrates really a great, a great project. And so we've done uh, s smaller projects uh, down at uh, Kings Bay, Georgia, right on the coast. Uh, our submarine base, Trident Ballistic Missile Submarine Base, 42 megawatts uh, in place, producing power right now. We've got one that is in the earlier stages of development, 167 megawatts out at a naval air station in Lemoore, California, in the San Joaquin Valley that uh, is going to be uh, fantastic, 900 acres of, uh, of solar panels. And oh, by the way, by putting ground matting on the uh, sol solar field, we uh, help keep away the ground squirrels from burrowing there, which keeps away the hawks, which keep running into our super hornets. So it's got an, an added benefit uh, to that as well. I mentioned <coughs> Great Green Fleet. Uh, in 2012, we did an experiment, and it was basically, can we operate our aircraft, our, both helicopters and, and jets, and our ships on a 50% blend of biofuel? And we did. We basically did it as part of the Rim of the Pacific exercise in the summer of 2012. We insisted that the biofuel be drop-in. In other words, it's got to work in the stuff that we have and are planning to have in our procurements, the hardware. And we don't have to fool around with changing filters or combustion chambers or storage tanks or pumps or anything like that. It, it basically, we wanted the moral equivalent of uh, jet fuel and, and marine diesel fuel. And we got it. We had to pay a premium for it because the biofuel industry wasn't as mature as it is today. But we proved that you could do it. And that was the whole point of it. Uh, the only thing we noticed is that uh, some of the, uh, the uh, turbine burners on some of our ships were a lot cleaner after the exercise. So I don't know. Go figure. So in 2016, this year, January of 2016, I was out in San Diego with our Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, and the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, and we launched the Great Green Fleet 2016. So this one, we wanted to launch it in a battle group, a carrier battle group, the John C. Stennis, that was going to go out and patrol the Western Pacific for about seven months. And it, normal deployment, nothing special. Oh, by the way, on the way back, they participated in this year's Rim of the Pacific exercise. But back in January, they were headed out. So Tom Vilsack, Ray Mabus, and I are on the bridge of the uh, William P. Lawrence, a guided missile destroyer, Arleigh Burke class, taking fuel from a tanker, U U.S. Navy tanker, that was biofuel blend. And the bio feedstock was beef tallow that came from Nebraska. <laughs> How about that? You didn't, you didn't know you had such a key power to run our Navy uh, out there, all the way out in the, in the Pacific. And it was really a, a, a signature moment. And later on, when they came back from the deployment, uh, I met them out in Hawaii for the Rim of the Pacific exercise. 
I brought a dozen biofuel executives with me. We flew aboard the USS America, and a big amphib uh, ship. Oh, by the way, it has hybrid electric drive. I drive those guys crazy. I say, oh, this is the Prius of the sea. I get that, you know. <laughs> they don't like it. They're warriors, you know. Don't want to drive no, no stinking Prius like I do. <laughs> so we flew out to the America, and about a half dozen of the folks came with me on a helicopter over to uh, a Korean naval ship, their best, one of their best classes of ship, guided missile destroyer, Sejong the Great, named after a, a, an ancient Korean uh, emperor. And uh, we went alongside another Navy oiler, and we took on that biofuel blend. The biofuel feedstock came from Nebraska. In fact, nine of the 26 nations that participated in the in the uh, Rim of the Pacific exercise took on biofuel because we had the data. We said, hey, we've tested this. It's drop in. Go for it. And they did, and they liked it to the extent that in the case of the Australians, they are at the early stages of developing a biofuel uh, industry, biorefining industry with feedstocks from Queensland, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, use that in years to come and be able to pull into a place like uh, Darwin or other parts of Australia, Perth and Western Australia, or up in Singapore in that critical area, and get a choice besides simply, okay, give me more petroleum-based uh, fuel. So it was really great. And oh, by the way, uh, four other navies that uh, had, I guess, stricter engineers or something like that, they took 10,000 gallons each back with them in their ships in restricted tanks, and they're doing the testing. So bottom line, 13 navies, including ours, biofuel blend, it set a new normal. Of course we're going to use biofuel. If we can get it and it's drop-in and it's competitive with, uh, with petroleum, hey, great, let's do it. It's good. It, it provides us alternatives. Let me say a, a, a key point here. Sometimes we, uh, in this contentious uh, political environment, I heard there was a contest or something that just uh, took place, and I don't know, people are talking about it all the time in Washington. I, I'm not sure. I haven't been following that. But in this, uh, in this uh, contentious environment in which we, uh, we live, uh, we tend to label each other too much. You know, do you like fossil fuel? No. Do you like renewables? No. Okay, let's just kind of calm down here and be a little pragmatic like those Marines in Afghanistan in 2010 and say, hey, what's the right solution? What's the right balance, environment security, economic security, energy security? And just get rid of the labels. So to that end, I will be the first to tell you that Petroleum has been very, very good to the United States of America and to our, our Western European allies. And so is coal. So the people that are still in those value chains are good people. They're producing good value. We've just discovered over the past couple of decades that there's a downside to fossil fuel one that we didn't really recognize. We didn't necessarily love living downwind from a coal-fired power plant, but hey, you know, it kept the lights on, it kept us uh, warm, and uh, so, you know, what's, what's not to like about it? But because we've discovered that there's a downside, and it's called greenhouse gas, or carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we say, we ought to think about how we're going to be uh, using this, how much we're going to use it. And oh, by the way, as luck would have it, there are alternatives. And it's not going to take place overnight. It's going to take a while. We didn't get to this uh, energy portfolio that powers our nation and the nations of, of around the world overnight. And we're not going to go away from it. But the faster we go away from it, the faster we start getting dividends in energy security, in environmental security, and economic security. And it's good for our national security. So why should we be worried about uh, climate change, greenhouse gases, global warming. There was a report in April of 2007 from an organization called the, Mer the uh, Military Advisory Board, part of Center for Naval Analysis in Washington, a think tank basically. 
So about a dozen of us retired three and four stars from all of the services, not just uh, Navy and Marine Corps, but all of the services, put out a report. And the key takeaway from that report was climate change will act as a threat multiplier for instability in areas of critical national interest for the United States, a threat multiplier. What we're talking about, if you look around the world and you see all kinds of fault lines, surely geological fault lines, but I'm talking about economic, religious, political, people are fighting about a lot of things uh, around the world and some of them are just brutal, active wars as we see in the Middle East right now. Others are brewing under the surface, but there are these fault lines and many of them occur in areas where there are fragile governments, fragile societies. So if you take a look at a future that has, because of global warming, increased intensity, increased frequency of weather-related events, it puts pressure on those fragile societies and fragile governments. They fail. They create a vacuum of power into which all manner of bad people are going to run. It could be organized crime, it could be paramilitaries, it could be terrorists, as has happened in many places in the Middle East. So we need to understand that that added pressure of climate change is not a good thing. And we need to recognize also that it isn't just one thing. It isn't just rising sea level. Sure, that's a, that's a problem. Of course, you know, if we really get the sea level rising, we're going to need a bigger navy, so maybe that's not so bad. I don't know. But we see it as multi-year droughts in California, going on into its sixth year now. It drought down in Australia about a decade ago that was devastating to their economy and their, their, their agriculture. Uh, we see uh, vulnerable societies uh, along the, uh, the Indian Ocean, South America, et cetera. And then right here in the United States, there are times when in California where we have one of our great Marine Corps bases, Camp Pendleton, we can't do any live ordnance training, no pyrotechnics or anything because we're going to set the wildfires going and it's going to bring down our telecommunication utility lines and, and cause all kinds of havoc. So direct benefit or direct uh, detriment to our ability to train like we need to fight over there. Places like uh, Hampton Roads in uh, southeastern Virginia, where we have the world's largest naval base. I mean, hundreds of, uh, of sailors, and, and we have Marines in the area. Navy SEALs, SEAL Te Team 6 uh, operates uh, down in that area in a place called Damneck. And the, these areas, these bases, looking ahead, are threatened by climate change because of sea level rise. In fact, we did a study that was wonderful in that the partners in the study were the federal government, all aspects of the federal government, not just the Department of Defense, the state of Virginia, and local communities, 17 different uh, municipalities around the Hampton Roads area, studying what was going to be happening with sea level rise if we didn't do anything about it, and what would happen, what could happen if we did some things about it. So the things that we are doing about it are also not going to happen overnight. We cannot afford from the private sector to state to federal to suddenly just become Holland and build the dikes and uh, expect that, hey, that's our definition for resilience. We need to, though, in our planning, and every time we have something bad happen in, in that area, the bad is usually at the form of a storm. In the summer months, like we had uh, earlier this fall, uh, Hurricane Matthew came ripping up the, uh, the southeast coast, did a lot of damage. So Superstorm Sandy, a little bit further north in uh, New England and especially New Jersey and New York. What we find is that, yes, we're worried about sea level rise. Uh, in the case of Hampton Roads, it's not just that the sea level is rising, it's the land because of subsidence is actually sinking at the same time, so it's a double effect. And what that can do is it can put things underwater that you really like, besides submarines, of course. It can put roads, 
bridges, tunnels. It can put substations for electrical distribution from Virginia Dominion Power Company, for example. Those substations supply every aspect of our economy and every aspect of our society in Hampton Roads, just like they do here in Omaha and throughout Nebraska. So it, we don't have to wait 100 years to deal with this problem. We, the problem exists right now when we have king tides, when the, the moon is uh, lined up with, uh, with this, within uh, the solar system and causes flooding of major highways, people can't get to work for four hours, six hours at a time. When we have a northeast storm, or we have a hurricane that comes ripping up the coast, we have got the data that if we have a, a category three hurricane, which it isn't a question of if, it's a question of when, Hampton Roads goes down for, for not days, but weeks of functionality, military as well as civilian. So yeah, this uh, climate change stuff is really, really important to us. And that last piece I'm talking about, how can we, not just in the Navy and Marine Corps, but across our society, become more resilient? How can we, to use the old Timex uh, phrase, take a licking and keep on ticking? Uh, so one of the things that we're, we do in our planning, hey, if I'm uh, putting a building in a FEMA floodplain, um, uh, I don't think it's such a good idea to put the servers in the basement. Uh, you know, we'll put them up on the second floor or something. In fact, we probably ought to make the basement a little bit higher and uh, consider the fact that high winds, uh, strong currents, water flooding. We ought to be thinking about our backup power systems, not just the grid power that I described with substations for distribution from the commercial utility, but how do we do backup power? How do we do diesel generator sets or bring in solar power from, from various parts of the uh, area? And it's that thinking of resilience so that we don't just simply uh, forget the lessons of past hurricanes, but in thinking about the certainty of future severe weather events that we are taking those into consideration and we're building in different ways. Not all at once, but in an incremental evolutionary way increasing our resiliency, increasing our security. So if you go beyond the waters of the United States, the shorelines, and you go deploying with the Navy and the Marine Corps, you have all kinds of partners and allies around the world. We're dealing with the uh, Indian Navy in a way that we haven't uh, since uh, I can remember, uh, it, you know, certainly not uh, during the Cold War. We're dealing with uh, navies like Bangladesh, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Japan. And we, in our engagement with them, are saying, we've got a common threat. And that common threat is climate change. And it's going to manifest itself differently in all of your nations. But let's talk about, as we did in Hampton Roads, let's talk about ways in which we can, in fact, not just become victims, but rather become part of the solution by toughening up our infrastructure. If you're a fish farmer in Bangladesh, or if you're uh, a, uh, a rice farmer in Vietnam, and you're along the Mekong River, you want to make sure that uh, you're not just assuming the way things have been for decades or even centuries, it's always going to be that way, because change is happening, and it's caused by global warming. So threat multiplier for instability. It creates missions, more missions for our Navy and Marine Corps. Anytime there is a natural disaster here or overseas, you're going to find the United States Navy and Marine Corps involved. There were a total of all services, including the Coast Guard, 14,000 people in uniform that responded to Superstorm Sandy when that happened several years ago. Hurricane Matthew, same thing, we had about 5,000 in addition to the folks that uh, lived and worked on those bases along the uh, southeast coast. Overseas, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. We want to make sure that we are prepared with the right kinds of equipment that can stop the dying, bring water, bring food, bring medical attention, and start the rebuilding process as we tur turn over 
the uh, scenario to uh, folks that are in the humanitarian assistance business full time. So more mission, but it's also more risk at the higher levels of mission warfare. What do I mean by that? There's pretty good analysis that this whole business of Arab Springs, especially what happened in, uh, in Syria, not the total cause, but a key, key contributing factor and catalyst was crop failure due to unprecedented uh, failures of crops because of higher levels of heat. If you think about the water, food, energy nexus anywhere in the world can cause a lot of problems. I don't pretend to be a farmer, but I enjoy the products that farms produce, including beef tallow for our ships. But uh, food sustainability and, and agriculture really, really uh, is threatened by higher temperatures. I know that uh, there are folks here in the audience that could wax eloquent about uh, rates of germination in, for, for corn or other, other field crops that can be affected uh, by uh, things that are happening weird with the weather, like higher temperatures much earlier. The fact that uh, you can have an on again, off again, super cold polar vortex uh, this winter. By the way, coming from the East Coast, I think we're having one right here in Omaha right now. Just, just saying. And, and you can really see local changes, and you can have all kinds of arguments about, oh, well, this isn't climate change or global warming. Okay, hey, great. Let's just agree that something's happening. Let's agree that there are a set of solutions that make sense and we're not mortgaging our future or our children's future if you, in fact, are uh, making investments in a cleaner, carbon-free or carbon-less portfolio of energy. And that you're making investments in infrastructure. Oh, by the way, I heard that was one of the platform planks that we're going to really invest in infrastructure. I say, yes, let's do it. But let's do it not the way we've always done it. Let's consider resilience from all kinds of threats. We can argue uh, if increased frequency and intensity of tornadoes or thunderstorms or ice storms are or are not connected to, uh, to uh, global warming. But I, uh, I heard a governor once say, you know, I'm really getting tired over the past couple of years of having these 100-year storms. You know, they're just really... Uh, <laughs> Something's happening, so let's, let's take some practical steps. If we had this room filled with all of the governors, six territories, 50 states, and we said, okay, governors, please write down on a piece of paper your two top uh, concerns for your, your state or territory. I can guarantee you, if not 100%, 95 plus would be saying public safety, and economic development. I'll tell you what, global warming and the way it manifests itself, a threat to public safety. So we ought to be doing something about it to make ourselves safer and more resilient and tougher and secure. Economic development, wow, that is called turning a challenge of climate change in all the different ways it manifests itself into opportunity to create new value chains, jobs, companies that are producing cleaner energy that not only mitigates what uh, the potential effects of greenhouse gases are, but really, really produces a better mix, a more resilient mix of, of uh, power for all of our functions in our society and for our economy. So I think that governors, um, if you're concerned about public safety, be concerned about uh, intense and more frequent weather events. If you're concerned about economic development, don't look in the rearview mirror. Look through the windshield. Look ahead and say, where are we going with our energy portfolio? It's not towards coal. It's towards the sun. It's towards wind, geothermal, hydro. And make that match between what your goals are for economic development and the trends that are happening. And oh, by the way, as we all hitch our wagon to this, uh, this uh, infrastructure renewal train, 
let's go ahead and do it in a way that makes us more resilient, creates those jobs, and gets us a better, get, gets us a better outcome. Now, I want to go to questions and answers. Uh, well, questions, let me just say, I can't promise any answers. But before I do, because uh, this is a, a, a conference on conservation, I'm going to read you a quote. What is a conservative, after all, but one who conserves, one who is committed to protecting and holding close the things by which we all live? And we want to protect and conserve the land on which we live, our countryside, our rivers, mountains, plains, meadows, and forests. This is our patrimony. This is what we leave to our children. And our great moral responsibility is to leave it to them either as we found it or better than we found it. President Ronald Reagan remarks at the dedication of the National Geographic Society, June 19, 1984. Gipper, you had it right, and we are conservatives, and we are going to do everything we can to conserve our resources, to make them better, and to leave something better than we found. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Okay, please raise your hand if you have a question. Anyone who has not asked a question yet today. I'll come back to you if you've already asked a question later, but I want to make sure that anyone who has not asked can go first. Um, so it sounds like the Navy and Marine are doing wonderful things. I was curious, are the Army and Air Force far behind or how far behind? Th they are. Um, I, I must say humbly, they are behind. <laughs> oh, by the way, the Army-Navy game is this Saturday, so I hope they're really behind. <laughs> but no, all the services are, are really making great progress. Uh, my counterparts uh, in the Army, it's uh, Secretary Catherine Hammock, and in the Air Force, it's uh, Miranda Ballantyne, have programs similar to ours. We did, in fact, primarily through our establishment of this Renewable Energy Program Office that really, really um, operated at the speed of business and partnered with the, uh, the private sector, whether it was financial community or developers or utilities, we moved out pretty quickly. And of course, we've been leading the charge on the biofuel going back to that Great Green Fleet experiment in 2012, but Army and Air Force as well. Uh, I had uh, a conversation with Miranda Ballantyne, my Air Force counterpart, yesterday, and she is trying to focus on uh, energy resilience. And the nice thing about renewables is that they contribute to resilience because they produce distributed energy resources. And you couple renewables up with, with storage, battery in most cases, and you can create a microgrid that will be operating in smooth harmony and, con and conjunction with the grid supplied power. But if in, the, in an emergency you need to go off and just uh, suffice your, uh, or meet your own uh, ener energy load needs or electrical load needs with what you can produce in a distributed energy, that's a good thing too, more resilience. When the sun is shining and the birds are singing, you can reduce the cost of electricity by having uh, distributed energy resources and storage. When it really gets bad uh, because of weather or some, some other event, cyber attack or uh, electromagnetic pulse, you can continue to operate, reduce level of functionality, but this uh, whole idea of resilient energy and producing energy security is really, really starting to go move forward with all of the services. Okay, more questions? Have you been asked to brief any of the committees in the Senate or the House uh, that deal with military affairs? Yes, uh, a lot of it, a uh, lot of the testimony up on the Hill was, relates to uh, bases, installations, and uh, you know military construction and, and all of that. Uh, but some of it is, in fact, on on energy. We mo more often meet with individual members who have questions uh, in either a positive or a negative way, but 
I'll tell you, uh, during my three and a half years in office, I have seen the level of, uh, of no noise, if you will, really come down. There are some members that still, you know, defend uh, their portion of the energy pie, you know, right, right to the nth degree. But um, more and more, we're seeing a better appreciation of the science. We're not there yet. We need a, a long way to go before we can uh, have a good common sense uh, revenue neutral carbon tax. But we are. <laughs> but. But I think that there's more acceptance. And I've been asked a lot, especially since the 8th of November, hey, what's going to happen when, uh, when you leave, when Secretary Mabus leaves, when the president leaves? Is this all going to come to a, a grinding halt? And the answer is no, it isn't, because we have a strong business case. Why would we want to go backwards if it cost us more money? Why would it, we want to go backwards if it risked more lives? And so. I believe that we have reached in the United States a tipping point related to uh, clean energy that it's going to move forward. A couple of years ago, there was a proposal down in uh, or over in Kansas uh, to uh, re get rid of the renewable portfolio standards, and uh, and you know folks thought, oh yeah, pretty conservative legislature, governor, and you know that thing's that's done. Turns out the business community said, hey, wait a second, this is good. I like wind turbines in my farm field. I like the value chain of parts and transportation and everything that's associated with this new form of energy. And it was defeated. The, the bill was defeated. And I think it's that pragmatic view that we have to take. Let's quit having theological arguments about climate change and let's go ahead and, uh, and say, hey, what makes sense to do? And, and it's, is it good for our economy? Is it good for our, our energy security? Is it good for our environmental security? And oh, by the way, we cannot ever forget that our environmental security begins at home. And it is local and regional air, water, land uh, that we want to keep clean. And for all of the reasons that we all know, so. It's, uh, it's a real, real key to have those conversations. So I think the business case needs to uh, continue to be stated. It needs to be applied locally uh, and nationally and internationally, but I think that we're, we will move ahead uh, in, into the future because we're past a, a tipping point. We need to be mindful if there are some uh, silly things going on. I mean, I've heard proposals we're going to bring back a coal economy to the United States. Okay, I'm a big financial bank, investment banker up in, up in uh, New York. And uh, some utility's going to come to me and say, hey, uh, Mr. Finance Man, I'd like to get uh, $5 billion. We're going to put in a really great, it'll be clean coal, but we're going to put this, uh, this, uh, this plant uh, just south of Lincoln. And... Uh, you know, folks are going to love it. It's going to be good for the folks in West Virginia or Mo Montana or whatever, and it, it's going to be great. And I'm going to go, what rock have you been living under? <laughs> because you think that I'm going to risk my investors' money in a carbon-producing large coal plant? Forget it, because it's going to take four, five, six years to build it's intended to operate for 40 or 50 years. Last time I checked, we have changes of administration that occur uh, from time to time. So I think that for the business case, uh, we're not going to be seeing any large rollback. There could be some throttling, if you will, uh, throttling down in, the, in a speed sense on some of the uh, initiatives that we've got going. But I, I think it's going to continue because we have a very, very powerful business case. Let me, let's, let's give a test. How many people here like electricity? Ah, I love it. You know, it's really good stuff. All right, we've all established we love electricity. So all of us lovers of electricity, how many of us wouldn't mind living five miles downwind from a coal-fired power plant? Come on, I thought you loved electricity. Right, now, how many would not mind living five miles downwind from a solar farm. Yeah, 
there are alternatives because they don't have the downside uh, that uh, our wonderful coal that, as I said before, has brought us wonderful capabilities, economy, military capability over the years, but it's time to change, and the good news is there are alternatives. Questions? Um, you brought up revenue neutral carbon tax, and with your experience. Yeah, what does that mean? I've heard that. You know. <laughs> Should I explain it? No, I, <laughs> I, I like it. Um, with your experience with Congress, I have a couple of questions. What do you think the biggest barriers are for them right now? Um, what do you think the timing on such legislation might be? And then what can the average citizen do to help move that forward? Uh, I think the barrier primarily are vested interests. Um, I think that um, it would have to be um, couched in terms of this is good for our economy. Uh, it can be really, really helpful in accelerating the creation of new value chains and, and a new uh, energy, uh, energy sector. Um, but I think the vested interests of fossil fuel primarily, uh, are that's going to slow it down. Uh, I think that uh, it might not happen uh, in, uh, in this administration. It, it could, but it would probably have to be precipitated by something bad happening uh, in terms of uh, Mother Nature, which we all don't, don't want. But uh, it'll take a while. What can citizens do? Um, say, hey, look, what if we could really continue good, solid economic growth? And what if we could create jobs and what if we could have better local and regional and global environment uh, and do it in a way that, uh, that doesn't uh, take money out of people's pockets? In other words, it gives people choice. And the choice is how much carbon intensity do I want to have in my life, in my business, in my community? And that's what carbon neutral, uh, if, if it's done well, carbon tax would do. So make that case. And I think it really, and we need to put it in practical terms. Uh, we tend to be abstract. Okay, carbon neutral carbon tax. Up, oh, I fell asleep. You know, uh, forget it. I'm not, yeah, right. You're one of those geeks. Are you from one of those elite west, east and west coast places? No, I'm from Nebraska, and here's why it makes sense for Nebraska or for Omaha or for Lincoln or wherever you want to have that uh, that benefit. Uh, thank you for your talk. I think this is a really poignant and useful perspective for Nebraskans. Um, you use the term a lot, resiliency, which I think makes sense for um, military capability to be able to operate in the face of unpredictable change, that sort of thing. Um, I wonder about conservation. So does the military also have practices and procedures and a language and a set of uh, operation around conservation and not just resiliency, being able yeah. to operate in the face of change, but also sort of reducing its, its, right. its uh, uh, resource um, load. So. Yes, it does. Um, we, um, I, I could say, we talk a lot about technology. I've talked about partnerships with, the, with states, with the pri private sector. The third element, and probably the most important, is culture. And our culture in the Navy and Marine Corps and, and, and increasingly across all of the services is one of valuing energy for the mission. And so especially, uh, it's a generational thing in, in, in a sense, but I can read you quotes from uh, uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, the Chief of Naval Operations, our four-star fleet commanders, right on down to ship commanding officers, right on down to senior enlisted ranks that, that, se that get it that if we can do the mission with less energy intensity and get it done, that's what we want to do. And I'll give you a practical example. We've got four uh, guided missile destroyers that are based in Rota, Spain. They are configured for anti-ballistic missile defense. If somebody uh, to the east, I won't name any names, does something stupid and fires something, these uh, ships would be on, not all at once, but rotationally on patrol. So what you want to do when you're out there as a, as a missile defense ship, you don't want to be pulled off your track because geometry really counts. You don't want to be pulled off on your track to go alongside an, an oiler to take on fuel. 
So by having hybrid electric drive, by operating the ship's uh, engineering plant in the most energy efficient way, you can extend the time that you're on station uh, by 40% uh, by, by just being aware, hey, I don't need to go racing around the seas. Let's slow it down. And let, it's kind of like, uh, you know, not doing jackrabbit starts at a, at a red light and slamming on the brakes uh, when you get to the next one. Uh, and I think that is true. It, I know it's true in our aviation uh, areas, in our, uh, our surface warfare, and certainly with our Marines. And it, uh, the, the Marines have, uh, it's been going on for about a year and a half now, this uh, initiative called Energy Ethos. And that has a Marine, when he's living in garrison, in, in the barracks, on the base, Camp Pendleton, Camp Lejeune, whatever, turning off the lights, be, being mindful of their own energy portfolio, their own energy consumption, because then when they go into the field, they're not going to be uh, prone to just sit there idling a, uh, a seven-ton uh, diesel-powered truck. Uh, I'll tell you a story. Yesterday, out in uh, 29 Palms, which is in the Mojave Desert, had a big, big uh, Marine Corps exercise just winding up. So the last day, we had folks out there from the Marine Corps' Expeditionary Energy Office, which was formed after this uh, event uh, over in Afghanistan that I, I talked to you about, demonstrating some things that uh, the Marine Corps is doing. So here's one I really love. I'm going to I'm gonna, I hope somebody likes puns because I'm going to give you a real good one. So they had uh, this Marine Corps Mark I motto howitzer, except in the demonstration yesterday, the whole control and aiming system was powered by solar panels. So it's a solar powitzer. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for serving. <laughs> so one of the uh, uh, it isn't quite a holy grail, but it's close, is this whole idea of waste to energy, where you take something that's a liability waste, uh, municipal solid waste, for example, and you turn it into uh, an asset. Well, one of the ways you do that is, of course, with recycling. You reduce the volume. But the other stuff, we're seeing companies that are starting. We have a, a, a waste to energy um, demonstration going on in Hawaii at, uh, at uh, Hickam uh, Pearl Harbor base. And it's really, really uh, starting to take off. But I want to establish some credibility on this waste to energy. Um, a couple of years ago, before I took over this job, I was asked to uh, address the Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, up in uh, northern Maryland. And uh, the uh, summit, they called it, was the Manure to Energy Summit. <laughs> no kidding. And I was the keynote speaker <laughs> at lunch. <laughs> so on the program, they said at the Manure to Energy Summit, and the keynote luncheon speaker was going to talk about finding the sweet spot. <laughs> so I said, look, if you guys wanted to find the sweet spot, Manure to Energy, you should have had this forum up on Capitol Hill. There's plenty of feedstock <laughs> up there. But, I, but to your point, recycling, and I think that uh, I've heard it said that the United States of America is the Saudi Arabia of municipal solid waste. And we are. So why do we keep dumping it in landfills uh, and uh, when we can harvest uh, the energy from it in various ways? Now, some of it is, is happening in the form of methane extraction. We've got our Marine Corps Air Station out at Miramar has a methane landfill uh, uh, powered, uh, I think they're getting about four megawatts uh, out of it actually. And uh, so more and more of this is going to happen and the technology is getting better, more efficient. 
and we've got the feedstock. I have a question about um, North Dakota. What personally have you learned or the Navy learned or Marine Corps about our actions up in North Dakota recently? We're not gonna put a carrier battle group up there. <laughs> Red River's just not that deep. Um, are you talking about the, uh, the pipeline? Uh, exercise and First Amendment rights, peaceful assembly, freedom of speech, and uh, I think it's a good thing. And, and I think that, I, I think that um, you know, there, there'll be some analysis done probably for years over what woulda, coulda, shoulda happened early on in the process involving key stakeholders. Uh, th that is key on anything that we do, regardless of the type of, uh, of energy, whether it's fossil or renewable. Uh, there's con there isn't a single form of energy, fossil, renewable, whatever, that somebody doesn't like. I mean, or doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, fall in love with. There's always something. It could be um, wind turbines and bats or, or birds. It could be uh, solar panels and um, creating uh, artificial lakes. Not true. Uh, we've done lots of studies with the FAA on that. But there's always, there's, it's a, uh, you've heard the term NIMBY, not in my backyard. Have you heard banana? Build absolutely nothing anywhere nor any time. <laughs> so we got to make the trade-offs. And may maybe that's the right answer for a particular project. Don't build it. But if we see, if we do the business case and we're objective about it and honest and we use real good data, not, not slanted one way or the other, uh, the outcomes are a lot better if you involve the, uh, the stakeholders early. Um. So after listening to your lecture and your answers, it seems that you're really It's going to be on the test, by the way. I just wanted to mention. It seems that you're motivated um, for economic reasons, uh, which is fine, but money is a material thing. So where are the moral reasons for wanting this change? I think the moral reasons are um, leaving the world a better place. Um, I think the moral reasons are human health. Moral reasons are avoidance of conflict. Uh, and I'm not talking conflict of lawyers in a, in a courtroom. I'm talking about people killing each other, as they are in way too many places. Tremendous moral uh, reason. The problem is if you were to say, I've got a big conference table. On one side are environmentalists. On the other side is big business. The big business folks are saying, you guys don't get it. Our economy, our quality of life, the, the health care system, everything that we value is dependent on what we do, what we produce, our goods and services. Environmentalists say, you are killing our natural environment. You're uh, mortgaging our future, our, our, our children's and, and their children's futures. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. Where we can find some balance in it and, and because if, if we're saying as environmentalists or as, uh, as con conservationists, if we're wa wagging the moral finger or poking them in the chest or whatever, um, it, doesn't, it, do it isn't effective. You can be as right as rain on it, but it just doesn't get it done. So what I think needs to happen more and more is let's look for the common, the common good, if you will. Where can we find an intersection of our interests and do things in a, in a, a naturally, natural capitalist way? There's a book, wonderful book by uh, my good friend Amory Lovins, Rocky Mountain Institute founder, called Natural Capitalism. And it was, let's consider financial capital, let's consider human capital, let's consider infrastructure capital, but let's consider natural capital. What is the, the uh, use of that capital. Are we wasting it or are we investing carefully in that? And I think that's, that's what we've got to do. But, there, but make no mistake, there is a, a moral dim dimension. We just need to use it as wisely and as carefully as we possibly can. Thank you for your excellent talk. Um, major scientists have been saying actually for half a decade, um, that we're in an unprecedented planetary emergency. Does that 
understanding an unprecedented planetary emergency? Does that understanding permeate the military, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in such a way that it can be communicated to our president-elect? It, it does not. Okay. Uh, um, it, it, short answer. It is uh, more, there's more awareness, though, of the dangers, as I've described them, in our military than there ever has been before, and this will be conveyed. So uh, I was having a conversation earlier. One of the, uh, the nominees uh, for cabinet positions that I'm really pleased to hear about is, uh, is General Jim Mattis as Secretary of Defense, nominated as Secretary of Defense. I know Jim personally. He's an unbelievable warrior, but he is a warrior scholar. He's got a library of over 7,000 books, and darn it, he's read them all. And uh, he is very thoughtful. I'm talking history, philosophy. In 2004, he was uh, the Marine Division commander in, uh, in the western Iraq, the Anbar province. And one of his quotes at that time was, free me from this tether of fuel. And in 2006, a report was, was put out that expanded on that thought about, hey, let's take a look at our energy portfolio. Let's figure out uh, what are the direct and indirect costs of how we are going about this thing called military operations. And it has direct applicability to just virtually everything in our, in our, envir in our uh, economy and in our society. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I think the only other question that I would have, sir, would be if just in light of the, um, the appointments, sorry, I have a microphone now. In light of the appointments that have been made um, for both the EPA and for Department of the Interior, it would be more of that. I know that you cannot be candid because you're a member of our government, but any advice that you could give to us who are concerned sure. about how to keep going? Yeah, I think uh, talk to stakeholders and convey stakeholder concerns to elected officials. There, we've got a, a, a constitutional process, advice and consent of the Senate, uh, all the cabinet officials. Uh, in fact, they're about I think 400 or so political appointees that have to be Senate confirmed in any administration. And uh, I think uh, getting the issues out on the, uh, on the street. Um, it's, I mentioned the business case. That makes me, uh, makes me optimistic that we have, in fact, reached a tipping point. But we've got a, a wonderful system of checks and balances that is also uh, in our favor. And one of those checks and balances uh, are, uh, you know, we've got a, a judicial branch, and certainly uh, there are those uh, those folks that. Um, by the way, you Sierra Club guys got to stop suing the Navy. Come on, it's really, uh, you know, <laughs> su sue China about what they're doing in the South China Sea, the the coral reefs. But um, the other thing too is we have a federal system with 50 states, and so uh, the federal government. Uh, isn't going to make a lot of progress in New York or Massachusetts or California or Oregon or Washington or whatever. And perhaps in the not too distant future, if you line up your messages well in Nebraska as well because of the business case. And I think that uh, uh, certainly the visibility of cabinet officials, EPA, energy, what have you, uh, could be of concern based on statements that they have made in the past or their positions or what have you. But it's going to create a good opportunity for dialogue where more and more the science is compelling and uh, I think uh, the argument will be uh, ultimately uh, in, in our favor. Oh no no I, I no no uh, the the characterization uh, of the the uh, emergency if you will was uh, th that was the characterization I was saying no about that it is a, a compelling and you know immediate response emergency I'm paraphrasing uh, your your words now that you know we've got to go there and and you know pound the table uh, 
There, there could be some folks. Sam Locklear, who was a, the Pacific commander uh, a couple of years ago, said in congressional testimony, my number one threat is climate change. And that is true for, in the minds of many, many senior military folks. But if you go to someone uh, as the new commander-in-chief or secretary of defense and you start saying, we have got to do something about this right now and basically people are getting killed and you've got, um, it's the old Russian proverb, shoot the, shoot the wolf closest to the sleigh. We've got a lot of wolves around that are, uh, are tearing at our, uh, our a many aspects of our national and international security. And that argument of trying to put that emergency forward, it's one of the challenges of us communicating about uh, climate change because it is not a short-term problem. It is a longer-term problem. So people can be procrastinators and say, well, you know, I don't think it's going to happen, but if it does, you know, somebody's going to take care of it. The other thing that's tough is it isn't any one thing. As I said, it manifests itself in many different ways, in many different areas, but you've got to take the, the collective uh, evidence and say something is happening and why can't we do something to mitigate and also make ourselves more adaptable to uh, what is already happening with our climate. In the light of what you've said just in the last several minutes, I'm reminded of uh, John McLean saying, it's not the Navy's business uh, to conserve energy, but it's been the Navy's business to conserve energy for 200 years. Right, So you've got to go, go beyond that. And this is not a facetious question now. Can you not, in about 15 or 20 minutes, get the new president's elect's ear on exactly what you've been saying for the last right. uh, half hour? Yeah. Um, I love Manhattan. <laughs> get the word out there. I will say this, there was a pretty significant uh, conversation yesterday uh, between uh, Al Gore and uh, President-elect uh, Trump, and, his, and I think uh, I am led to believe from what I've read that, uh, you know, younger generation, his kids uh, are pretty serious about uh, sustainability and, and climate. So I think that's going to be somewhat of a mitigating factor. Yeah. Okay, I can take two more questions. I appreciate your comments and I love your attitude. My question is about sonar testing that can be detrimental to marine life. Right. Can you say it, anything about that? Yeah, we spend a, an, an enormous amount of time and money on being good stewards of the natural environment, including uh, sharing the seas with uh, marine mammals. Uh, that is right directly in my portfolio. That's the part of the environment part of my portfolio. And uh, we uh, are always, if you want to learn something about marine mammals, go on the bridge of any ship, any Navy ship, and ask the officer of the deck or the lookouts or the, the helmsman about, to tell you about marine mammals. Because we have procedures in place where we have got a whole checklist of things that we need to do before we use active sonar, whether it's uh, low frequency active, mid frequency, or, or uh, what have you. So we are very, very aware. Here's the problem. Uh, there are a lot of wonderful, wonderful organizations that are concerned about the ocean. I'm on the National Ocean Commission. In fact, we just approved the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic Ocean Plans. A unbelievable um, accomplishment. We signed the paperwork on it uh, last week over at the White House. And we in the Navy and the Marine Corps take great pride in taking care of the critters that share our, our, um, our oceans. It's characterized in dramatic terms that the Navy's killing uh, marine mammals and, and whales. Not true. Uh, we, do, we work very closely with uh, uh, fish and wildlife, with uh, national uh, fisheries at NOAA. And um, it, we're spending, for example, uh, $9 million over the next three years in uh, understanding migration patterns for marine mammals out in the whales in particular and dolphins out in the western Pacific. Uh, and there's, that's just the tip of the iceberg, if you will, in terms of our investment. 
We've got some of the best marine biologists. We partner with Woods Hole uh, Institute of Oceanography, Scripps out in, uh, in San Diego, Oregon State, uh, and the list goes on and on. So if you hear that the Navy is, um, is uh, out there just killing or damaging marine mammals, uh, you, you need to do a little bit of reading or give me a call. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, we do environmental impact statements on just on everything that we do. So in an environmental impact statement, uh, we'll, we'll have to say if we're going to use a new so sonar system or get a rule to operate our existing sonar systems for the next five years, um, we uh, have to do some analysis and, and estimate how many takes. That's the word in these environmental, well, what's a take? What do you think a take is? Something dead, right? No, it isn't. Uh, it's the potential for causing some change in behavior. So I was a commanding officer of an aircraft carrier home ported in San Diego. We would uh, go out uh, from our berth at North Island out to sea through the, the, the channel. And there are these wonderful uh, California sea lions that love nothing more than to haul their fat bodies up on the buoys and, uh, and, and just sun themselves. Well, the danger signal, if there are ships that are approaching each other uh, too closely, just to give everybody a heads up, is five short blasts on a ship's whistle. If you blow five short blasts on a ship's whistle, and that poor sea lion wakes up in a start and goes into the water, it's a take. Uh, so I, I'm going down in a level of detail that probably is much more than what you anticipated, but I want to make the point we know about the environment, we work very closely, and we take great pride in not harming the environment, ma marine mammals or, or otherwise. Okay, not one perfect, more. but we're getting there. One more question. I really have only um, one criticism for you tonight. I really wish you would run for president. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I come from uh, southeastern Massachusetts, a uh, place called Attleboro. I went to school in a place called uh, Taunton. And our Secretary of Energy, uh, Ernie Moniz, who's done a superb job, uh, is from Fall River, Massachusetts, not too far uh, down the road from, from where I went to school. When I was going to high school, and Ernie was going to high school, he graduated a year ahead of me. Ernie was the president of the math club. I was not. <laughs> That's why I became a naval aviator. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank everybody.